So um, at this point, we'd like to move into our program. And we have two parts to our program. Uh, a short introduction to the history of uh, Fitchburg dairying. And uh, that will be by um, several of our board members and Bill Kinney, uh, Winnie Lacey and myself, and uh, Bill. And then we will introduce our special speaker for today. So at that point, I would like to invite Winnie to come up with me. And we are going to um, tell you a little bit about the uh, history of the dairy industry in, um, in Fitchburg. So Winnie and I thought it would be um, interesting to talk a little bit about the uh, dairy industry such as it was here locally in Fitchburg and tell you a little bit about the, um, the dairy industry and the creameries that were here. Um, Winnie did some research in that area and then I would like to speak about what it was like to live on a dairy farm here in Fitchburg as I did in the 50s and the 1950s and the 60s. So Winnie, you want to tell us a little bit about uh, the creameries? And well, I, I don't know much about the creameries because I wasn't here at that time. <laughs> but there were creameries spread around because farmers had excess milk and had to go someplace. There was one at Oak Hall. There was one down on near Went Road. Did we have others? I mean, that we know of? I don't know. But the, I think the thing that really intrigued me was the uh, commercial dairies that started here. Starting with Woodbend Farm by the Bancroft Brothers, and that went into being Bancroft Brothers, and then they went into Madison as Bancroft Dairy. And I just did a little bit of extra research on this and found that after their after they sold to the people who brought Bancroft, they had a period of time when they couldn't be into a commercial thing, but after that time period was done, they started Silver, oh my gosh, Silver Springs? Something like that. Well, it was another, it was another part of their dairy. And they were also, uh, one of the Bancroft brothers was also involved in the Charmony Farms out on Mineral Point Road. And he had gone to school in the, um, um, in the ag short course and had learned how to take care of milk so that the bugs weren't going to get the people. <laughs> uh, I, don't know, I think that's about, there was dairy farms all over, um, every farm, and back then Pittsburgh was a community of farms and most every farm had dairy cattle. So, tell what it was like, Catherine. And what was it like to live on one of those farms? Uh, thank you so much, Winnie. Uh, the dairy industry was was uh, the industry that we had here in the in the township of Fitchburg at that point. And uh, I lived on a farm, on uh, the O'Brien farm, on uh, Seminole Highway, just south of Lacey Road. And my uh, my dad, Leo O'Brien, and his two brothers, um, Gerald and Edward, uh, ran the farm together, and they had. Um, uh, then the next generation, my grandfather had owned the farm prior to that, and my great-grandfather had purchased the uh, part of the farm, well, the farm such as it was, and then was added on to by my, grand, my grandparents. So, what was it like with Fitchburg Farms 50 or 60 years ago if you were to drive through the township of Fitchburg? <clears throat> as, as Winnie said, they covered the whole landscape. And each family would have a variety of animals. So, you might see pigs, sheep, horses, chickens, a variety of animals. And then we also had a variety of breeds of cattle, milking shorthorns, brown swiss, Holsteins, and then of course the red barns that we're used to uh, seeing that are disappearing now, um, little by little. Uh, they dotted the landscape and hay was stored, of course, in the upper part of the barn, and then the cattle were housed below. In the concrete silos that stood right beside the barns um, contained silage, which was made up of the chopped whole corn stalks that were stored for winter feed for the cattle. And the farmhouses stood near the barn where the family lived, and then we had all of the outbuildings. So you might have a granary, corn crib, machine shed, um, and a chicken house all there, there on, the, um, on the farm still. And then, of course, there was always a space saved aside for the family garden. 
and usually the um, farm wife was the person who took care of the garden, and that the harvest, the extra produce from the garden, was canned for the winter time, so that you would have those vegetables in the winter time too. So the farms were really, to a large extent, self-sufficient operations. And then the dairy cattle you would see in the springtime, when the warm weather came, the, the cattle would be out in the fields uh, in pasture. And that also meant, of course, uh, because the cattle were getting outside, it meant cleaning out the barns and sheds, and then spreading the manure in the fields for fertilizer. You can see what an efficient system that was. And then spring planting, all this beautiful weather today reminds us of the spring planting, doesn't it? And it was always a race to see who was going to be first out in the fields in the springtime. And the planting began uh, early in the spring with the oats. And then the corn planting usually took place in May. My dad loved to go out for the field work, and he took great pleasure in planting those straight rows of corn. Because, after all, the neighbors were going to be watching to see what your crop looked like and the quality of your work in the fields. It was right there for everybody to see, right in front of them. And then the corn and the oats for the cattle uh, that were grown, uh, then on our farm we would take those oats and, and ear corn to the mill in Verona each week, and then it was ground into 100-pound bags of feed for the cattle. This is my cousin Pat O'Brien is sitting here, and uh, I had a wonderful time talking with him several weeks ago about the details of the farm. So I thank Pat for all of that uh, accurate information. And then milking, of course, being a dairy farmer, is a guarantee of long hours, seven days a week, milking morning and night. And I remember so well my dad getting up at 5.30 in the morning to go out and begin that process, and then getting home at 8 o'clock in the evening. But we also, of course, had the advantage of having my dad around all day. He would be out uh, doing work, and so he's readily accessible. And he would always be home for all of the meals. So I remember his presence. Even though it was a lot of hard work, he was always there. And our particular farm, the O'Brien farm, had about 50 milking cattle. And that produced about 16 to 20 milk cans, which each held about 12 gallons of milk. Transporting the milk to the market. My uncle Edward O'Brien owned a truck for picking up milk cans from neighboring farmers. I just remembered I hadn't uh, borrowed the <coughs> microphone from many. Oh. <laughs> so I'll try to do both of these at the same time. So transporting the uh, milk. So my Uncle Edward owned a milk truck, and he picked up milk cans from neighboring farmers, some of which are here today, like the, the O'Briens, the Lacys, the Waylands, the Duns, the Bromans, who are here in the front, yeah, sitting here in the front, and every day, and then he delivered them to the Madison milk producers on South Park Street in Madison during the 1950s until 1962. And then prior to trucking milk to market, of course, the railroads would pick up the milk. The milk cans would go to several different locations right here in Fitchburg. Stops were at um, Syene and Fitchburg Settlement on Went Road and Stoner Prairie. Those were all depots now where the uh, Badger Bike Trail now runs. And then that milk was delivered to Madison Dairies for processing and sale. And as an aside, Many farmers for a time during the Depression, when times were so hard and milk prices were so low, uh, spilled their milk at the Sain Depot in protest for those low prices. Um, in 1968, our farm entered a new era of milk storage with the introduction of the bulk cooler. And so no longer were those 90 pound cans of milk needed to be lifted into a milk truck Rather, the milk was piped into a large cooler in the barn where it was stored until the large tanker truck arrived and then it was transported, the milk was transported to Madison. And then about uh, the particulars about milking, cows were first milked, of course, by hand, but with the invention of the milking machine, the cows could be milked automatically several times a day, I'm sorry, several times, several cows at a time. And of course, one of the dairy chores was cleaning and sterilizing the milking machines, as well as feeding the cattle as they were milked. We built a milking parlor in the early 1950s on our farm. 
This meant that the cattle could walk into their stanchions four at a time, and they could be milked on a higher level. So that meant that the milking machines could be attached without bending over, so that was another labor-saving device. And therefore, a larger number of cattle could be milked more efficiently and quickly. So just bringing up to today then, the herds, of course, have increased in size. Um, Pat and my cousin Tom uh, had, when uh, they were milking, probably at their maximum, about 200, 200 uh, cows. Uh, so they had expanded that dairy operation from tremendously from the 50 cattle or so that um, my dad and, his, and my uncles had. There is a concentration on one aspect of farming, so not the diversity in terms of um, having many different kinds of animals on the farm, but rather the um, focus on, on the dairy cattle. So there are fewer, larger farms, of course, and the cropland production increased to feed larger herds. So the pasturing of cattle in the fields is much less than in the past, and the feed is brought to the cattle. And then you see the large sheds as you, as you drive through the countryside in Wisconsin where dairy is done. You see those large sheds for the cows rather than the barns. And we're going to come to this original research that's been done for Fitchburg. There are now only a handful of active dairy farmers in Fitchburg. And um, I think uh, Winnie has said there are four. Am I correct, Winnie? I think there's four. There's the O'Brien Farm, there's the Hageman Farm, and we have with us today, where are you? Pat? Pat Kane. He still has a herd. How big is your herd? 40 cows. Pardon? 40 cows. 40 cows. Very good. That's, I would consider that to be one of the smaller herds in the area. Glad to have you with us, Pat. And uh, there's, uh, whether there's the, the state farm still has uh, a herd, is that correct? Yes. yes. Okay. And so the big changes in the history uh, of the um, Fitchburg, uh, Fitchburg community and dairy. So um, we have one of, uh, actually it is uh, Carol Kinney's husband, Bill, has done some original research for us that he wanted to share with us today about about the uh, dairy farms in Fitchburg. Bill, would you like to come up and tell sure. us what you've done? Well, I, about six weeks ago I heard uh, some talk about uh, the dairy farms in, in Fitchburg back in the olden days. And I thought, well, that's fine to know how many there were, but let's get some names on it. So I sat down with a yellow pad and a sharp pencil and uh, took road by road and jotted down the names of, of the farmers who were there in my memory back in the 40s and 50s. Um, got that accomplished and I thought, well, that's a nice list, but um, I'll bet Paul Lacey could add to that. So I went over and, and sat with, uh, with Paul and Milda for, I don't know, an hour, hour and a half, whatever it was, and got a few more ideas and that worked out so well. I thought, well, Roger Cohey over in the east side of, of town, he ought, to, uh, he ought to have some ideas too. So I went over there and we, we talked about it, and that uh, was okay, but I thought, you know, I better go see Tom Kane. <laughs> Tom and Jeannie Kane, um, of course, Tom has lived uh, the farm life in, in Pittsburgh uh, a long time. He's even older than I am. Uh, <laughs> Tom used to go to, to all the auction sales. It was really um, kind of interesting, because he, he was the kind of guy that, um, if they had a, a pail of, of bolts on a, on a flatbed wagon uh, and nobody was bidding at it, he'd bid a half a buck. Pretty soon it'd be go for a dollar and a quarter or something. So the farmer always was happy to see Tom Kane show up at the auction. <laughs> he did a good job. Um, yeah. You know, back in the, when the Fitchburg book was written, the, the Brown book that we know of as the Fitchburg history book, uh, it, showed, it said on there there was 107 dairy farms. Uh, in Fitchburg. Um, in 1975, uh, somebody, I'm not sure who it was, added them up and, and had um, 58 active dairy farms. Um, we shut our dairying down in 1965. Um, and on this list that I have here of, of uh, by road and by name, I come up with 108 um, back in the, in the 40s and 50s. 
So afterwards, if anybody would like to um, take a look at this, I'd be happy to, to share it and, and uh, talk about it. Maybe uh, I might learn a few more things about who had dairy farms and who didn't. Because I may have someone here that didn't have dairy, but I, I think it's pretty accurate. Um, any question? Anybody that had a question or concern? If not, I'll get Winnie back up here. Yeah. Did you also uh, cover the areas that have now been developed? Like um, sure. yeah. the Highlands and Seminole? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I did. Yeah. Did some of the um, farmers do their, uh, dairy farmers do their own bottling? Well, I think that would need a special permit. I don't think there's much of that going on, but I know of anyway. Uh, we had Bowman Dairy right in our midst, and Bancrofts, and, and uh, the dairy over by, uh, by Highway M there, and, and went real with that. So I don't think any individual farmers did any bottling. Like This is called original research. And I know that Bill spent a lot of time uh, going uh, through all of this. And we will have that for our archives here at the Fitchburg Historical Society. So I think that's going to be just a wonderful piece of Fitchburg history for us to keep forever. Thank you, Bill. Well, we are now ready for the main attraction. Um, when when uh, we were thinking of a speaker for this spring, uh, we always are so interested in bringing uh, people that uh, have a broad appeal uh, to the community and beyond. And so I called up uh, the UW uh, Dairy Science Department, actually. George Shook is not here today, is he? Let's see if he... George Shook is a professor at UW uh, Madison who was uh, also head of the dairy department for a number of years. So I talked to George, and um, he suggested our speaker that we're going to have today, uh, he had Janice. He said he's done some really interesting things in his life, and I think you'd enjoy having him as a speaker. And uh, so I just want to tell you uh, some of the things. So he's been come well recommended. <laughs> uh, Ed has done a lot of very interesting things in his life. He has been an author and a journalist, an oral historian, a dairy farmer himself, an entrepreneur. And uh, he's helped bring the Madison Muskies to the city. He worked in developing the Capitol Brewery. Uh, he produced a series of first-person audio stories of dairy farmers and cheesemakers for the Wisconsin Milk Marketing Board. And he authored Creating Dairyland, How Dairy Cows Created the Wisconsin We Know and Love Today. And, of course, he was a dairy farmer himself for a period of time in Soldiers Grove, Wisconsin. So he speaks from also first-person experience. So we're delighted to welcome Ed uh, as our speaker today. What else do you know about me <laughs> that I don't want to know? I've got one myself. I have my own. Good morning, or afternoon, I'm sorry. You do have to use that mic so it comes no, I've on the video. Oh, got one here. Yeah, I got my own. Okay. I'm Very special good. guest. All right. I got my <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I wish I knew more about uh, Fitchburg dairying, but unfortunately I don't. So I'll have to tell you the rather grand story of dairying in our state. So I called my book Creating Dairyland because after I had finished writing it, I realized that this was an act of that bringing dairy farming, establishing dairy farming, cheese factories, was an act of immense creativity that didn't exist before, say, 1850. So from 1850 to about 1920, Dairyland was created. And it wasn't just the barns and the cows. It was everything. So that's what I want to talk about. I say here that it was a, a remarkable revolution, and indeed it was. It may have been the greatest development story of Wisconsin history. Maybe American history, but I won't go that far. It was an immense work of creativity. Um, as I say, the transformation of man and land. So my goal in writing the book, this is now six or seven years ago, was to help non-farmers in particular learn how to read the landscape. So you see a 
we all see this scene, right? And everybody knows, well, this is a dairy farm. That's the barn. There's the home. Here's the silo. But they don't know what brought that about. They don't know what it means, for example, <coughs> to have a silo. So someone said, you know, it's where you put the corn. But it had tremendous historical ramifications. Silos in Wisconsin changed everything. I'll talk about that later. But one of the things that changed is young men being able to stay on the farm uh, and get married and have their own farms. Because before, there was no winter milking. And so, I mean, that's right, you didn't milk in the winters. The young men had to go somewhere. Well, they went up north to be lumberjacks. They went out west to look for gold or whatever. But that's what I'm trying to get at. There are things that you see every day as we drive through Dairyland that um, have a deeper meaning if you could only read what it means. So that's what I'm trying to do here. And I call that merging the scene, the silo, with the unseen, which is history. OK. Oh, OK. So as I said, Dairyland was created basically out of nothing about 150 years ago. I'm going to tell that story in a minute. But we see cows, and we know they're out there. We know they provide a tremendous economic uh, push for Wisconsin. But why do we have cows? And that's the story. Why do we have cows? So about 150, 140 years ago, a new idea launched itself in America. Based on the American Revolution itself, it was the idea that men and women who were not wealthy, who were not landowners, who didn't inherit their wealth, could become prosperous. And the way they would do that is by thinking not about yesterday and how my father used to farm, or how the lord of the manor told me to farm. They were getting ready for tomorrow. So this idea that we can live for tomorrow is one of the key spiritual ingredients in dairy farming. So dairy farmers often call themselves progressives. There's a magazine, Progressive Dairy Farming, which has been around an awful long time. Well, that spirit of Wisconsin progressivism, and I mean La Follette and people like that, that worked its way, either worked its way down or worked its way up into how people thought about this new world. Because they could create this world any way they wanted. So I call it bringing the, in oh, I call it, sorry. I call it bringing the enlightenment to the farm. And it's what we know as the Wisconsin idea, that the state and its resources and its wealth exist for the betterment, better, betterment of all of its residents. And that was really the key to the progressive idea. It's changed now. Um, a friend of mine, dairy writer, says that he thinks that uh, dairy in Wisconsin was uh, one of the greatest economic development stories in history. It, uh, well, I'll explain. OK, so as I say, you know, most of our ancestors came from Europe. And we think of Europe now as this lovely, sort of expensive Disneyland kind of place. But, you know, it was pretty terrible. And that's why they came, of course. So Wisconsin itself became the frontier around 1840s and 1850s. I want to read you um, a poem um, about uh, Wisconsin. Welcome to Wisconsin, all ye who wish to toil. Vast harvests are awaiting the tillers of her soil. Welcome to Wisconsin, all ye who come for gain. An empire's wealth lies hidden within her wide domain. Welcome to Wisconsin, all ye who would be free. The justice she dispenses is famed from sea to sea. Welcome to Wisconsin, all ye who seek the chance to join the van of progress in the world's new renaissance. That sums it up. I mean, that, that's why people came to Wisconsin, and that's what they began to believe was possible. So 
I just have this picture because I think that is one tough cow. <laughs> and I always want to show it because I have nothing to say about her particularly, except I would not want to meet up with her in a dark alley. <laughs> but this guy, I'm happy to meet up with a dark alley. He is what I call the face of Wisconsin dairy. Hold on, my, pull my pants up. So it's that cow and Dennis Iverson here, who were the workers who created Dairyland. So this is a typical uh, shot from about 1850 or 60 of the typical farm of the day, which were homestead farms. They had a little bit of corn, a couple acres, lots of woods, and maybe one or two cows. But they were an afterthought. The cow was a way that you fed your family. It wasn't an economic unit, as you might say. So this is what I call before the Big Bang. In a minute, I'll begin to describe the Big Bang, when the universe of dairying was created. Now, interestingly enough, this picture is a real family here in, in Liberty Pole, in um, Vernon County, I think. The little girl down at the corner was the first licensed woman cheesemaker in the state. And this family got into che making cheese right at the beginning and are still making cheese. So I don't know if any of you know the name Sid Cook at, um, what's it called? You know, the, you know Sid Cook? He's the greatest, most decorated Wisconsin cheesemaker in the state, I'll, I'll think of it. Anyway, that's his, this is his family. And this is how they started. Now, um, uh, Sid has done tremendously well. He wins all sorts of international prizes. So that kind of encapsulates the story. This one family, poverty, uh, one cow, to a vast uh, enterprise. This is a picture of uh, wheat farming in Wisconsin. I wonder if you know that Wisconsin was a leading wheat producing state. Uh, before dairying came along. It was also, we changed everything in Wisconsin. So before it was pioneers like this family I just showed you. A couple cows, a little corn, hay, and all sorts of, not much, chickens. But when we came along, people flipped out because it was lots of money. It was during the Civil War. There were railroads now to the east where this, the wheat could be consumed, and Wisconsin became the wheat leader. The problem with wheat in those days in particular was that it sucked out the value of the soil. So wheat was all take and no give. So they'd cut the stuff and they'd ship it out to the east coast, and nothing would come back, and the land started suffering. And also, the morality of Wisconsin farmers began to suffer because they started, we might say, flipping these farms. They were into the money aspect. Oh man, I'm gonna buy this farm, work it for a year, I'm gonna sell it to the next guy, make a profit, and move out west. And so that combination of moral, I don't know, I'm call it degeneracy, but <clears throat> moral problems, and the, agronom agri uh, the uh, agricultural uh, problems of wheat, left Wisconsin in very bad shape. In fact, so bad that most men, or many, many, many men, were heading out west because they could grow uh, wheat in North Dakota, Minnesota, much less expensive. Wisconsin was being depopulated because of wheat. And then around 1860 or 70, I guess, there was an infestation of um, beetles or an insect infestation. If, infestation that basically ruined the wheat crop for a couple of years. And so Wisconsin farmers were out of luck. But along came people that I call the preachers of the gospel of the cow. They came to sing a much more moral song and a much more economic song. And that I read you what they said. Hmm. 
Well, I'm sorry. First, I'm going to read you about the um, depletion of the land. This is written by a gentleman in uh, Beloit. He said, the alarm cannot be too loudly sounded in the ear of Western farmers to beware of plundering the future for the sake of present advantage too dearly purchased. In other words, you're selling your inheritance. And so these are the moralists of the dairy industry. And they will combine with the scientists. Find us. Hmm. OK. So here is the sort of, um, you might say, part of the gospel. This much at least is certain, that with the years, the kingdom of the cow is a constantly widening empire. To some one-time fertile regions, she comes late. But she comes to save. When the soil miner has wrought his perfect work, and the earth no longer gives her increase, the cow comes to the rescue. From the beginning, she has exemplified the doctrine of soil conservation, where, the, where she makes the land her own. Green car carpets of pasture possess the fields. Alfalfa throws its perfume to the breeze, and corn waves and rustles in the sunshine. There, great new barns rise in the place of the old, and white-walled farmsteads speak of peace and plenty. There, Contented farm folk found dynasties by striking the roots of their lives deep into the soil. That is the gospel of dairy. If you adopt cows, you will change everything for yourselves. So I like to say dairy was a ray, a way, an idea of uh, rebuilding the idea of the future. So the wheat farmers came through, it was all quick cash, quick out, quick in. And Darien said, no, you need to stay on the land and build it slowly. Build it carefully. Increase your herds. Increase your soil's uh, vitality. So I like to say it was a get rich slowly scheme. <laughs> and it worked. It really, really worked. These people, these prophets of Darien, were very concerned about the moral and economic uh, crisis of the soil. They were interested, as it says here, in the salvation of the soil. I like to say that uh, this is the poop that saved Wisconsin manure. Because now, all of a sudden, if you kept cows, you had something to return to the soil. My mirror, I mentioned wheat. You go and you ship it off to New York or whatever. Now you have something to come back and it stays on the farm, and it builds rather than cut, takes down. And this is where, really, the sustain, what we call the sustainability movement came from, the moralizing about sustainability that we're, we hear quite a bit about, really started on dairy farms, mostly in Wisconsin, not exclusively. And here's the most important part of this, I think. Uh, it's all about changing men. Not women, I might add, and I'm going to talk about that some. It's about changing men. So early farmers, wheat farmers, were a rough sort of a lot. Um, they had freedom to go into the bar, you know, to the tavern, I mean. And uh, they were not necessarily good husbands. Uh, and they weren't good stewards of the land. They was, as they say, all take and no give. And so part of the preaching was to save the, what you might say, the economic, social, and emotional souls of men. Um, so mankind was going to be the target for this plan of improvement. So it wasn't just about the soil. It wasn't just about money. It was about much more than that. Does anyone know who the guy is? The cow I can tell you about. <laughs> okay, did you guys take fourth grade Wisconsin history? Yeah, well, failed. So this is W. D. Hoard. One might say the the chief preacher of the dairy movement, not the only one, and former governor of Wisconsin. 
Um, and so W.D. Hoard was the voice of dairying, this new kind of dairying, this proselytizing dairying. And he had his own farms, and he used them as model laboratories. And he published a magazine that's still being published today called Ford's Dairyman. Uh, so he was an interesting character, I must say. Um, a friend of Abe Lincoln's, Abraham Lincoln's, and a sardonic wit, which I'll now demonstrate. <laughs> So here's what Horde said about farmers. And again, remember I was talking just a moment talking about changing men. So here's what he says. One reason why there is so much truth in the oft iterated remark, farmen don't pay, is that there is no, not another business on the face of the earth that in proportion to the numbers engaged in it supports so many incompetents. <laughs> we think of our farmers in Wisconsin, rightfully so, as intelligent, educated, forward-thinking, hard-working for sure. But farmers in the wheat days were not. They were layabouts uh, in many cases. They had no sort of sense of economic development or moral development. Um, and so Hort was out to get them. So the progressive, I guess you would say the credo of the progressives, including Horde, who was a progressive with a capital P. That was his political, he was a Republican, but from the progressive school, Abraham Lincoln school of Republicans. Prosperity, free markets, moral probity, and virtue. These are the things that would create uh, prosperity for Wisconsin. Another aspect of dairying, which the dairy promoters were very intent upon, was the spiritual side. They wanted to offer people, mostly men again, um, a spiritual alternative to the lives they had been living. And cows really are a kind of avatar, you might say, of contentment. A beast that you watch them in their pasture, you watch them in their field, and you just think, you know, everything's fine. This is a good world. And so this is a picture from Ford's magazine. I'm not sure I can read it, but I'll try. The caption. Those kind that in lust, lush pastures feed and lie down to comfort and contentment. The idea was to transform farmers into people who were comfortable and content. Again, it really worked. <coughs> So I call this the marriage of cow and gown. Um, the gentleman on the right is the grandfather of a, or great grandfather, never remember, of a very prosperous uh, farm up near Appleton. And his kids are now making cheese and they pasturing their cows. But he went to short course. Um, and, and that short course really was part of Lincoln's idea with the Morrell Act, which was farmers, merchant, farmers, mechanics, working men did have minds. Working men's minds could be educated, should be educated. They were, would be educated. And everything would change. And Short Course did that very thing. I call it the democratization of knowledge, and it's what's foundation of American uh, university life. So we all know that if you're a dairy farmer, you, uh, <laughs> you uh, select the cows that's going to be in your barn. Some have to go, of course. The better ones stay. But I like to think that cows actually created us. Because dairying was not for everybody. In fact, there were riots in towns when Horde came through preaching this gospel. Dairy farmers said, you can't expect us to do dairying. That's women's work. And anyway, we don't want to be tied to the cow. And so it was actual, you know, throwing rotten eggs sort of stuff. Um, and so over the years, the people who decided to be and stay dairy farmers were people, men, I mean, who tended to be kind, tended to be able to work alone, were extremely diligent and not scared of keeping 
of time, not scared of doing what needs to be done. And that's the dairy, when we think, when I think of dairy farmers in our state, I think of like that gentleman I showed you, Dennis Iverson, a whole new kind of man. Well, so part of the dairying credo was the introduction of science to the barn. So now there's a lot of science in our barns. Uh, butterfat testing, lots of bacteriology. Um, and of course, knowing what's a good cow and what isn't a good cow. So I like to say that um, learning to, new, to use numbers improved their lives. So they could have more productive farms. So farmers are very astute about what's making them money and what's not making them money, and whether they should move next. But in the old days, that wasn't the case. So, um, farmers and science and, of course, the university extension. Now, this may go to some of what you were asking earlier. The farm is factory. So you can see this is a 1910 or so um, thing in a dairy magazine. And they're promoting the idea of the farm as a factory. So you have inputs, you measure the output, you specialize. So this is the beginning of what should not be a bad word, but sometimes is industrialization. Farmers had a new mindset, and that was to measure things, to see if they're being profitable, to weigh what they buy as opposed to what they're making, and the farm is a factor. So you were saying farms in just 50 or so years ago were very, um, what's the word, had lots of different animals and different activities. Well, farming became more and more specialized. So I call this a revolution in, in rural history. You notice this picture. This is a farm family. He's playing with a radio. They're well-dressed. I'm guessing that the gentleman has uh, slippers on and not boots in the house. So this is the great movement to make men gentlemen. It also was a tremendous movement to keep men and women on the land. As I said, as you all know, that there was a tremendous urban emigration. So the boy wanted to leave the farm. And the, you know, how do you keep them on the farm? You make them prosperous. And you make them prosperous just like their city cousins. So there was a tremendous movement brought on by the University of Wisconsin sociology department, rural sociology department, and extension, to prove to farmers that they had a really good life that was no less than their city cousins. And um, again, you know, the sort of worked. Anyone want to argue? In the eight, 1900, late, 1900, no, late 1800s, in the beginning of the 20th century, Europe was starving. I mean, again, we think of it as this place with great food that you see on the Food Channel and all. But Europe was starving. I mean, the Irish potato famine. Uh, uh, yeah. Anyway, um, that sort of thing. That was a little earlier. But dairy farmers, as part of their business, wished to promote protein. And many saw themselves, again, this sort of moral thing of feeding the world's children, you know, the milk of mothers. And so even to this, today, it's a part of the spiritual background of many dairy farmers. This idea that what we're doing saves the children, in the starving children, in this case of Europe, and in Japan after the war. There was a great amount of Wisconsin movement to Japan to help them revitalize their dairy industry after the war. And that's based on this same progressive faith. So the byword became caring. It was all about <coughs> teaching men to care, care about their soil, Think about it in the long run. Build it up. Nurture it. Think about your cows. They often said, uh, 
A man should remove his hat when he enters a barn because the mothers of the human race are there. <laughs> so they had all sorts of admonitions to get men to be caring. And it became, as I say, the new morality for farmers. <coughs> <laughs> so I separate the word gentle men because that was the original use of the word. They wanted men to become gentle. And uh, so one of these other admonitions is, uh, they serve God who care for his creatures. These things were pasted all over barns throughout the state, these sayings. The hordes, dairymen would have these every week, these admonitions to become a different, kinder man. And so this is kind of the point. They wanted men to know that they need to think about how others feel. How does this cow feel? How would you like to be in there? They're trying to teach empathy. And conveniently enough, it was good for business. So the back door was good for business, or the front door was it's good for business. The back door was it'll make you better. So this is what I'm saying, that uh, you could have both good souls and good business. That was a real interesting uh, <laughs> play they made. <laughs> okay. I want to read my favorite thing. It's a letter to the editor of Ford's Dairyman from about uh, 1912. This guy writes into Hordes Dairyman. I like your talk about sentiment in dairy work. You said that to succeed, one must be in love with the cow. I wanted to get up then and tell the audience that there was at least one young dairyman on the road to success. Just, just before the morning session of the convention, I saw a boy, just a chubby little fellow of 10 or 12 years, standing by the head of a little Jersey heifer. The little fellow placed one arm around the heifer's neck, placed his mouth to her ear as if to whisper to her, and then pressed his lips to the eyes of the little beauty. I imagine he said to her, do your best, Jersey love. Get a blue ribbon if you can. But if you get none, I will love you just as well as ever. This boy surely will be a successful dairyman. <laughs> Again, I think it worked. <laughs> Oops. So I mentioned um, silos earlier. I wanted to talk just a little bit in more detail about silos. So this is called the new dispensation for farmers. This genuinely new operating system for nature. So in the, throughout history, we had plenty during the good weather, and then we had scarcity during the winter. Silos basically turn that on its head. So now you could put up enough good feed to have your cows milk in the winter. And so there was to be no more scarcity. It was all abundance year round. And this um, uh, year round milking was a huge, had a huge impact. It started the creation of cheese factories. Because in the old days, if you only had milk for a few months, say through August or September, uh, it didn't pay from a capitalist point of financial point of view to open a cheese factory because you'd be closed for the rest of the year and you couldn't make any money. But all of a sudden, with the silo, with year-round feed, you could afford to open a cheese factory and invest in a modern cheese factory. Um, and uh, as I said earlier, men decided that they could stay on the farm all year because they could be employed. And being employed meant they could get wives, frankly. And so it, see, it stopped this emigration, or the major emigration, off the farm and kept men on the soil. I like to think that as you would go around, let's say, Fitchburg in the 1900s or so, you'd see an occasional silo. And they would be as if it was a flag saying, I've adopted dairy. Because at first, farmers did not want to become dairy. 
They wanted to have a diversified farm, as we said, with some cows, but they weren't ready to cast their lot into full-time dairy. But these silos said, yes, I am. I'm going to full-time dairy. And they were seen by their neighbors as kind of a statement. Um, and so as time went on, and I think I have this next. Yeah. So by 1920s, Wisconsin dairy farmers had converted, basically. So that more than half the in farm income came from cows. So this is a tremendous member of the, cow, the family I showed you with one cow. Now they've got a dozen. I like to think that uh, commercial dairying uh, was part of the women's liberation movement. Because on farm families in the old days, when she did everything, the, all the preserving, all the cheese making, um, she was worked to death. I and mean, it's just no time to make a family. So she did all the dairy. Dairying was women's work. But according to uh, Mrs. E.P. Allerton, addressing the Wisconsin Dairy Association, uh, she talked about dairy factory system, a blessing to the farmer's wife. Here's what she said. In many farmhouses, the dairy work loomed up every year, a mountain that it took all summer to scale. But the mountain is removed. It's been hauled over to the cheese factory. This is industrialization. This is women's liberation. From now on, farm women could spend much more time with the children, with the education of the children, with the condition of the home, in bringing finer things to the home, in refining her men because of industry. So this was the first, I'm out of order a little bit. This was the typical country store where Wisconsin farm wives, like Mrs. Allerton, would have sold their butter. But the butter was so bad, and it, it was uh, not very fresh, that it was so resold as Wisconsin wheel grease. <laughs> so she'd come in, and she traded her eggs, and she'd trade some of this cheese, which wasn't very good, or butter, for you know a bonnet or shoes or something like that. And then the guy would turn around and just get what he could for it. So how did we get to be the world dairy leader, right? There we go. <laughs> he didn't actually have that, I don't think. <laughs> Maybe he didn't. Um, people can be really kind of stupid. And so no one believed that Wisconsin milk was good enough to make cheese out. And hence the Wisconsin wheel grease and that sort of thing. But guys like Hiram Smith and Horde and people like that started encouraging the cheese factory system. Now, there was a time when Wisconsin blew it. We uh, were a major exporter of cheese to England. But farmers started cheating. And uh, cheese factories started cheating by adding what were called, what were called the filled cheese movement. They would stick lard in the cheese. And the entire market dropped out of England. And Wisconsin was left without any market. And so rebuilding that was rebuilding the quality of Wisconsin cheese. Some of the Wisconsin cheese was repackaged and sold through Canada, sort of. Um, remember I showed you the guy at the short course, the student at the short course? This is his mother. She was one of the first, again, female cheesemakers. Um, this thing, this wooden tub in that room still exists. If you ever go visit these folks, they'll show it to you. But it's kind of funky, you know? I mean, I'm not sure how good the cheese would be and how well it would last. Well, 30 years later, we had industrialization. This is a modern, so we look at these little cheese factories. Oh, it's so romantic, you know? And it was, sort of. But they were the cutting edge of industry in their day. I mean, we think of them as these, you know, homespun little places, but they were in industrial to the, to the hilt. The other problem was um, this, uh, how, to, how to bring money, capitalism, to this image of the wonderful home, the farm, innocence, and all that. That was a great trick. How to get 
these people, like the lady, to do real business. And uh, I'll tell you about that, but it's always a conflict. Does anyone know what the Babcock test was? Is? Yes. Yes. Butterfat. Butterfat. Right. So W.D. Hort said that the Babcock test did more than the Bible to make farmers honest. So again, there's always been this undercurrent, which has finally been washed out of cheating. But that's true everywhere. Um, and so the, the filled cheese crisis created, uh, taught progressives um, that human beings could be improved even if they weren't perfect. Progressives wanted people to be perfect but gave up on that idea. <laughs> and thought by passing regulations and laws, uh, you could um, get them to do the right thing. So what, yeah. What, she, what year are we up to? With I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I go back and forth. Um, this picture here, I'm guessing 1920s. So as I say, the, this sort of explosion of dairying into a stable universe happened from about 1860 to 1920 or so. Then everything was stable. Um, again, the big problem of rural America is how to keep the boys especially on the farm. And if you can't keep the boys on the farm, you're not going to keep the girls on the farm. So it was a huge thing of interest for these people. Um, and very, every, almost every farmer I've interviewed, I bet a hundred farmers, tell a very similar story about battling with the old man about how to improve things. Basically, Dad, I want um, manure spreader. Now nah, we got away with a lot of manure. What are you talking? We got away with it. And he says, "Okay, finally." He says, "Look, we're going to do this, or I'm leaving." Well, many of the farms that broke up were because Dad said, "Well, good luck to you," and go. But the farms that we still see, especially the really successful ones. I mean, I think any farm that's still going is a successful one. They worked that out. They figured out how to keep the boys interested. I heard the story of a, of a boy, and he wanted to get a uh, tractor and not use horses. So he had to plow. And his father says, nah, you know, they can't do as good a job as a horse. So the boy bought one anyway. And he's out there plowing. The father's running after him with a ruler, seeing just how deep are these furrows. And I guess they decided they were deep enough. <laughs> So again, Dad, we need to talk, I think must have been heard in every farmhouse in Wisconsin. Okay, I'm done, just about. But I want to remind you, as I say, that time waits for no red barn. Everything changes. Remember, dairying did not exist 150 years ago. It did not exist in Wisconsin. It exists as one of our leading industries and one of our worldwide, one of worldwide reputation. It was created. Well, things change. And that's the kind of thing that we often argue about at these meetings, is are these changes good or not? And finally, I'll read you one more thing. No, two more. Um, I call this the Dairyman's Prayer, written uh, by an extension agent around 1920-something. Dairy farming has helped to build a sound and stable agriculture in Wisconsin. Where the cow is, there is Arcadia. So far as her influence prevails, there is contentment, humility, and sweet, homely life. May we here in Wisconsin build the future of our farming on better farm profits, that we may have better farm homes, a better, a better citizenship, and a better agriculture, all of which is largely dependent on the dairy cow and her keeper. In this, all the people of the state have a selfish and personal interest. I think that is really still true. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Wisconsin that it's centered here and, and 
What? Why didn't it leak over into Western, uh, Eastern Iowa, Eastern Minnesota, and Northern Illinois? Well, I'd say they're, they're I mean, we hear about the paving of the roads, right. for example, but what else was right. there that... Well, all of the states you mentioned have um, plenty of grass, and grass in the early days was the secret to dairy. Um, the land here, especially the hilly land, is not given to vast cornfields. It's, it's changed now. It wasn't then. I think the German immigrant progressive, um, you know, 1848ers made a huge difference. Um, and I don't think we had anything else going for us. I mean, you know, other states have other things going for them. And this was pretty much what we had in terms of education. So that's my guess. Thank you. Sir. Well, I would also, Steve, say that we've got an abundant water supply sure. here right. in Wisconsin. Right. And we've got, we've got a fairly favorable climate. Right. That, uh, I mean, the areas in California and Florida, they're, they're, they're fighting heat that's right. pretty much year round. Mm -hmm. uh, cows, cows like 50 to 70 degree temperatures. And I think another thing is that um, we just haven't been the right place at the right time. Because the westward movement of people from the east was happening. They needed new land. They were immigrants and hungry to improve themselves. We've got to give a lot of credit to the University of Wisconsin, oh, yeah. too. Yep. They're forward thinking and developing agriculture. That's right. The soils program and the dairy program that they have there. That's right. That's tremendous. Ma'am? You showed the image of um, the wheat, and then the next slide was of three cows. Mm -hmm. So about what year was their transition? Yeah, so the wheat, what was called the, um, the, uh, uh, the infestation in the wheat fields happened around 1873 or 4. That was after the Civil War. After the Civil War. So Wisconsin had been depleting its soil up through the Civil War. It made a lot of money on the Civil War shipping out east. And then this um, insect infestation occurred. The land was dried up. And that killed that. So I, you know, it's hard to give an actual date. 1875, 1880. Uh, sir? Uh, yeah, I've been in Pittsburgh in 20 years. And I've seen more and more homes built on farms. What's the future of the farm in Pittsburgh as we get more and more people, more and more places to put homes? and less land to put it on. I think the future is, as you see it in many places, the expropriation of old dairy farm names for new developments. <laughs> you know, Whispering Pines Dairy Development. I, I don't, I certainly don't know, of course, but um, people want to be in the country. You know, or what looks like the country. <laughs> I think of going down Lacey Road to Seminole. What the beautiful farmland. Yeah. Someday it's going to go. I no, guess. no, it won't go. Someone will continue to, well, I suppose the houses, yeah. But people are still farming that land. It's just they're, they don't live right there. And so they can afford to sell five acres for a McMansion or something. You had a question, I think. No, nope, lady in blue? No, I'm wrong. No. Oh, anybody else? Well, I just want yeah. to say something. Uh, I used to spend my summers on the farm in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. And we were sent from New York City to be fat with them because we were very thin kids. Mm -hmm. So I remember Hoard's Dairyman, uh, that it was around. I wasn't reading it, yeah. uh, but I do remember it. And uh, the late 30s, early 40s. Right. And also, one of my duties was to drive cows to pasture. And there was uh, an electrified lane. Right. But the cows knew the way, and it was just a way for me to get out and you know, <laughs> get out from under my aunt's uh, thumb. And um, the, you know, when it was time to go back, occasionally I'd have to uh, hit them on the flank. Right. But I didn't like doing that. It seemed cruel. But I was told if they don't move, just give them a bang. A light tap. A light tap. A gentle tap. <laughs> A gentle tap, not a, a gentle. Tap. It was gentle. <laughs> no more questions? You guys are free to go. Uh, oh, I think it's on.